years. When a new color pattern appears in one group and is favored by the females there when selecting a mate, the difference in color alone could keep red and white and yellow banded rock grazers from interbreeding when they meet again. Adaptable jaws have also helped the cichlids create new species. Cichlids actually have two sets of jaws. The inner one mashes food, leaving the outer one free to evolve specialized teeth, which help them gather every kind of food imaginable. Fine-toothed rasps are for grazing algae. Interlocking spike teeth arm this barracuda cichlid. Miniature chisels provide precise picking for a goby cichlid. And no small fish could wriggle free from the spine tooth trap of a mackerel cichlid. But the function of some teeth is hardly to be believed. This fish is a predator. Its bold black and white banding mimics the coloration of the species upon which it preys. Still another kind of cichlid. It is a classic con artist, dressing like its victims to get in close before ripping them off. Luckily for the prey, it eats only their scales. It's a sophisticated predator, for its prey is not killed, but merely grazed. The victim's scales will soon grow back and can be grazed again. The cichlid's multi-purpose mouth is also a weapon. Opponents first size each other up. If one's mouth is smaller, he'll back down without risking injury. But if they're well matched, they'll engage in mouth-to-mouth -mouth combat. But the cichlid's versatile mouth is not only used to feed or fight. It can be a nursery as well. Mouth brooding is an amazing form of parental care. All cichlids share a deep concern for their young, another key to their success. A cormorant plunges through Tanganyika's crystalline water. There are so many cichlids here that eat algae, it rarely gets a chance to cloud the lake's liquid vistas. Predator and prey play out their chase in water as clear as mountain air. Life in the lake is built upon the flock of cichlid species that arose from their generalist ancestors. But while they diverged wildly, others have not. The freshwater puffer has been here just as long as the cichlids, but has remained virtually unchanged. Shellfish are its passion. Its mouth has been transformed into a powerful beak, the better to crunch crabs with. But even with a bite taken out of it, this one fights back. Puffers were highly specialized even before Lake Tanganyika was created.
They evolved in the rivers that fed into the new lake. That they've endured so long is testimony to the success of their design. But specialist designs are difficult to change, and they were unsuited to taking over the Virgin Lake. Unable to adapt to living in the lake itself, the puffer survives only as long as it stays in its River Delta home. A clawless otter prefers catching crabs to fish, but it finds the slow-moving puffer irresistible. But the puffer's apparent vulnerability is misleading. Inflating itself like a balloon makes it much too large to swallow and raises thousands of tiny prickles. No manner of acrobatics can persuade it to deflate. Inflating is another specialized trait, essential to the puffer's survival and to the otter's as well. Puffer fish have poisonous gallbladders, which could kill the otter should he eat it. Africa's early European explorers thought of this great lake as an endless sea. With the opposite shore out of sight, and with waves pounding its coastline, only the water's taste testifies to its true origin. The surf is fresh. 